This is Rosen Institute's Your Law Firm, where Lee Rosen and Ned Days cover management, marketing, finance, and new technologies for building the practice you deserve. Here's Lee Rosen. It's good to be with you today from Adelaide, Australia. We flew over here from Auckland, New Zealand, just for a quick visit to this city. We'd never been here before, wanted to take a quick look around. We're here for six days, which is just enough time to enjoy some coffee and pet a kangaroo and get a hug from a koala bear. All of that has been checked off the list. And now we'll fly over to Melbourne. We're going to settle in there for a good long stay. That'll give us a time to catch up on some work, to get our laundry done, and to really dig in and enjoy another part of this really very pleasant country. We've had a terrific time in Australia, and I'm looking forward to our time in Melbourne as well. It's time for your tech tip. I have done battle with beasts from across the globe in my time. Squirrels that routinely fell down the chimney of the house I grew up in, a roommate's bulldog with a deep desire to turn my leg into his concubine, the pigeon that flew into my cheap Airbnb in Barcelona and couldn't escape, I could go on. But at the risk of simply playing into a stereotype, I have to admit that Australia has some of the craziest animals I have ever encountered. You know you've made it in life when, in your late 30s, you are still mooching off of your in-laws. My wife and I spent the better part of a year with her parents while we dodged various lockdowns and worked on getting her a green card. It was a pretty good setup. We were living the dream in a sunny suburb of Brisbane, great weather, a walkable community, farmer's markets, and freeloading off of relatives, a quintessentially urban hipster experience. It was perfect except for one thing. Most nights beginning at about 12 and sometimes going until 4, or five in the morning, terrible noises, shrieking, gnawing, and rustling. I asked my mother-in-law, what is causing that terrible racket in the middle of the night? Great white sharks, kangaroos, emus, Tasmanian devils, box jellyfish? No, it was fruit bats. These fruit bats apparently like to do just three things. Eat, poop on the driveway, and make noisy, nasty bat love in the palm tree outside my window. Now, I had come across bats before. We have plenty of them in Florida. I once had to rescue a bat that became trapped in the stairwell of my apartment complex in college. And in America, rather shockingly, given the size of everything else, our bats are rather civilized. They are fairly diminutive creatures. Sure, some of them can get a little chunky, and they can carry rabies and can possibly turn you into a vampire, but I was pretty sure I knew what I was getting into when she told me that bats were the culprits. It was 3 a.m., the bats were involved in some kind of bacchanalian orgy of palm fruit and fornication, and I decided it was time to do battle. I went to the back door in my underwear and donned my armor. There's an apocryphal story that the Eskimos have 100 words for snow. That's not actually true, but the Australians do in fact have over 100 words for flip-flops. On the more formal end of things, you have thongs, which I will never stop finding funny because I'm mentally arrested at the age of 12. You might have formal thongs that you wear to church, and on the more casual end, pluggers, or plagas in Australian English, that you would wear for yard work and doing battle with the local fauna. A tactical set of pluggers was my choice in case I needed to make a quick escape or take one off and swat a fruit bat in the face if it tried to attack. But as I would soon find out, calling these bats was like calling Jeffrey Dahmer a foodie. I grabbed the nearest garden hose, took aim at the palm tree in the backyard, and let loose a spray. It was dark, but I could see the outlines of the creatures I had just disturbed, blotting out the moonlight and filling the night air with the sound of their terrible leathery wings. <laughs> For a moment, I thought I had unsettled a group of pterodactyls. These were flying foxes, giant bats with a wingspan of about three feet that I'm told pee all over themselves while hanging upside down to clear their hairy bat bodies of lice. I would be lying if I said I didn't nearly join the bats in emptying my bowels on the driveway that night. Sometimes we know just enough to get ourselves into trouble. We think we know what we're getting into. We think we have the answers. We think we are in control. I regrettably have a track record of doing this with software and website and technology projects. 
I know just enough about computer programming to make ill-informed decisions about the programming languages and toolkits I think we should use because I watched a YouTube video and thought a demo looked really cool. There's a very pretty blog I like that uses some obscure platform only five people have ever heard of, so that's what I want to use for the new website. I saw some Reddit post about voice over IP systems and CRM software this morning, so I'm signing a two-year $100,000 contract. Sometimes we are well aware that we don't have the first clue about something and that we need outside help. Sometimes we've earned our stripes, we know what we're talking about, and we have the battle scars to prove it. But oftentimes we know just enough to make ourselves think we have the right idea. When in doubt, be boring. When possible, ask a pro. And when you're sure you know exactly what you're talking about, ask yourself a few questions. It pains me to say this, but sometimes boring is best. Boring isn't cool, but boring also isn't surprising or terrifying. Going with the most common or popular option means that there is a well-established path ahead of us. There are developers familiar with the product and what we are likely to want to do with it, first and third party documentation, and likely an ecosystem of small vendors supplying add-ons that already do some of the things we will want to add in the future. Is it the best for your circumstance? Maybe, maybe not, but it will likely get the job done. So what about asking a pro for help? My wife and I love watching home renovation shows, and on some of these shows, part of the gimmick is that a professional architect is brought in to create a design for reconfiguring a space. As someone whose idea of improving a space is to either make it bigger or pick a different color, I am always impressed at how someone who knows what he's doing can come up with ideas that I never would have considered that make a lot more sense when I see them than just adding a few square feet or changing the color of the fixtures. The same can apply to our projects. That said, it's worth being aware of some of the biases and incentives your professional has. Somebody who has spent 10 years developing for a particular platform is likely going to want to use that platform. That's not necessarily a bad thing, and getting people to use what they are experts in is a better choice than asking them to use something that they're less familiar with. But try to get a sense of whether or not they can assess if their preferred method of doing things is a good fit for your project. Sometimes they'll tell you, that's not my specialty, or building what you want with the tools I use probably isn't the best way to go about it. But it's worth asking a few different professionals for their thoughts just to make sure you aren't getting a one-sided opinion. But let's be honest, we're not technological rubes. We know what we're doing. I set up that ring doorbell all by myself. I can open PDFs. I can BCC emails. I installed and uninstalled TikTok, baby. I'm half human, half machine. Be that as it may, how do we assess whether or not we are competent enough to make a decision regarding a particular technology? First and foremost, you need to understand the requirements of the project you are undertaking. Clearly defined inputs and outputs are critical for just about anything, whether you are delegating lunch orders or picking out a tech stack for a web app. If you don't yet have a clear idea about how you want the technology you are considering to behave, what you are expecting to plug into it, and what you are expecting to get out of it, that is step number one. Even if you are getting outside help, the clearer you are about the goals for the project, the better. Second, if you have picked the tool or the app or the language or the framework and think you are ready to move forward, do you understand the alternatives well enough to have arrived at your decision? Can you plausibly outline for someone else why what you've picked is a better option than, let's say, two other competitors? Can you coherently explain the long-term cost or upgradability implications of your choice when compared to two other competitors? If you ask yourself specifics like these about your choice, do you have the answers at hand or does your ironclad resolve start to waver just a little bit? A big one is whether or not you can name a shortcoming of your choice. I have often found myself drinking the Kool-Aid of a sales pitch or a YouTube video for some app or framework and being convinced that it was better in every single way than every other option. Is that really possible? Maybe, but it's unlikely. If you can't name a single trade-off or compromise you are making for the choice you've selected, it's an indication that you are not equipped to be making the final call. We're never going to know exactly what we're getting ourselves into when we take on new projects, and that's absolutely okay. As long as we have a realistic assessment of our own understanding of the various moving pieces and don't slip on bat poo when we're making a getaway, we'll end up with a solution that benefits the practice. I'm Ned Days, and that's your tech tip.
And now for your moment of concise advice. Recently, I watched a lawyer podcast on YouTube. It was shared with me by a Rosen Institute member. Interestingly, increasingly, podcasts are being offered as audio and also as video, usually on YouTube. Don't expect that from me. You're going to have to deal with all audio. Aside from my having a face that truly is made for audio, it's just too much trouble to make videos with our constant changes of location. I have enough trouble getting the audio done. There's no way I could get the camera and the lighting set up for a video every single time. So expect audio only from me. That's the way it's going to be. Now back to this podcast on YouTube. It's a podcast about law firm management, and the hosts were apologizing, really. That's what they were doing. They were apologizing for promoting the idea that a lawyer could build a law firm without being an active participant in the business. They claimed that this idea, this concept of being the owner rather than being engaged in management or in the practice of law is simply a concept that doesn't work anymore. They simply don't believe it's possible anymore to build a law firm as a business where you are the owner and you reap the rewards of ownership without having to be an active participant in the day-to-day -day of the business. And as I watched this video, I listened to these folks hosting the podcast, and they explained that at some point in time, they had this idea, this vision of a business where they transitioned from being the practitioner to being the manager, and then ultimately they ended up sitting in what they referred to as the owner's box. Sitting in the owner's box, they reaped the reward of the work they had done to build this business. Now, as the owners, they didn't have to play an active participant in the business, and they would get paid for their ownership. That was their vision at one time, but that wasn't working out. They were feeling stuck inside the business. They were having to deal with issues in the business, and they simply hadn't been able to achieve their vision. And I understand that. Sometimes things are difficult. We don't always get where we are going. But instead of taking responsibility for their inability to achieve the outcome that they wanted, well, instead of taking responsibility, what they chose to do in their podcast was to blame the concept, to blame the vision, to say that it was flawed. They are making excuses. They are blaming the idea, the vision that they had for its failure. And instead of crafting a vision and planning the steps and taking action and making it happen, they are getting frustrated, hitting a brick wall and deciding to stop instead of to figure out a way around the obstacle. You've got to watch out for what those guys on the podcast are doing because all of us tend to do it ourselves at various times when we are struggling, when we are finding it difficult, when we are banging our heads up against the wall. Well, it's not extraordinary for us to make excuses, to come up with a good story for ourselves for why we can't do it instead of finding the answers, finding the energy and the resources Resources for why we can do it. We need to look for how it can be done, not find a way to explain that it's impossible, that it can't be done. It's so tempting, though, to decide that it can't be done because then it's not us. It's not our responsibility. It's not our failure. It's the concept. It's the idea. It's the plan that was flawed. We're not to blame. That plan was never going to work out. But here's the thing, at least with regard to what they're talking about, it can be done. The thing that they're complaining about, this idea of sitting in the owner's box, well, it is being done. It's being done all over the world. It's being done increasingly in the United States where they live. You can build a business in any way you want. Whether you're an active participant or a solo practitioner or a passive owner, all of those options are available to you. In fact, law firms around the world are following this trend of having passive owners who don't work in the law firm, but they sit back and they collect the profits from their investments. This has been happening for a long time in Australia and in the United Kingdom, and it's increasingly becoming our reality in the United States. Non-lawyer ownership of law firms, it's a thing, and 
I'll tell you, that thing, which is actually happening, that's a huge stretch beyond the idea of lawyers owning law firms without working in those firms. The non-lawyer owners of law firms, they own shares of the law firm. They reap ownership rewards, but they don't come anywhere near the law firm. They sit only in the owner's box. If you want to be an owner and if you want to play no role in the law firm, then build that business. Build that law firm. You can do it if that's what you want to do. It's happening all over the world. Look around the world for examples. DFW, it's a publicly traded law firm. It has 31 offices around the world. Most of the owners of that law firm don't work there. Knight's Group, it's publicly traded. Keystone Law, Gately Holdings, Rosenblatt Group. These are all law businesses with owners who don't work in the law firm. It's a thing. It's a real thing. So you can do it too. You can do it your way regardless of what you hear on YouTube. So don't be discouraged by others' struggles or excuses. You can have this owner's box seat if that's what you want. I'm not just saying that. It's happening. It's happening around the world right now. There are lots of law firm owners who have no involvement with the law firm except to own shares in that law firm. You can do whatever you want with a clear vision, with persistence, with hard work. You can achieve your goals. You can build the business that you want. Don't let anyone tell you that it's impossible because if you bring energy and determination to this game, you can build anything that you want to build. So that's your moment of concise advice. Wrapping up from Adelaide, thanks for spending a few minutes with me and Ned today. We hope you have a great weekend and an even better week next week. Keep plugging away, moving forward, getting things done. You're on the right track. You'll get there, I promise. We're all in this together, and together we build better practices through better marketing, better management, and better technology. Until next time, I'm Lee Rosen. Thanks for listening to Your Law Firm. Visit rosensrules.com for our free course on the 10 critical rules successful law firms follow.